Now, the Health Minister, Dr. Zwelim Kize, has announced and confirmed uh, cases of uh, COVID-19 in the country have risen to 202. Dr. Mkize was addressing the media at Brandwach Primary School in Bloemfontein, where he was overseeing the screening of about 600 learners and parents. Now, to, uh, I'm sure that uh, many of you, uh, some of you starting to panic a little bit, uh, have some fears and some concerns and maybe questions that you don't quite understand with all the information that's out there. Well, we now have in studio Professor Nilesh Govinder from the National Institute of Communicable Diseases. And he's here and we're hoping that he'll be able to answer some of your questions and concerns. So we're op opening the lines right now. Call us and please try and be brief with your questions and so that we can get through as many as possible. That number to dial is 011-714-6842 or 41. That's 011-714-6842 or 41. And uh, the professor hopefully will be able to answer a lot of the questions that, that you have. All right, so let's just to see as the calls come in. Prof, thanks very much indeed to, for, calling, uh, for joining us and answering some of these questions. Uh, you must have been already fielding so many of these questions. And what questions generally have been most of concern to, to uh, uh, our, our citizens? I think people are concerned because we're facing uncertain times. Mm -hmm. And of course, um, people are asking about um, how, to, how to keep themselves safe, how to keep their families safe, how to test, um, how to access um, results, um, test results quickly. Um, and also people want to know what's happening yeah. with this epidemic. All right, let's, let's unpack the one thing that I think a lot of people say. So if I've got uh, this dry cough, I've, I've got um, something that feels like a fever, I'm a bit sweaty, what should I do? Do I go to the hospital straight away or do I go home and wait and see what happens? So I think the first thing to do is if someone is symptomatic and has the symptoms you, you mentioned, if they've traveled recently, yeah. um, if, they've, if they're a close contact of someone who's a confirmed case, if they're a healthcare worker yeah. and they're in contact with people who are confirmed cases, or um, in certain circumstances, we're also encouraging um, doctors in, in, in hospitals um, to test people with severe pneumonia, but I guess you're talking about yeah. people outside the hospital setting. Um, in, th in those circumstances, you want people to phone ahead to their GP or to their local clinic, not just to arrive. Right. Um, to say, I've got these symptoms, I meet this ca the case definition, and so... I'd like to have um, okay. testing done. And so you need a doctor's referral to, to, to get, get the tested. testing done. You can't just arrive. And, and exposure fact, is, is key, isn't it? Someone who might have been, if you're a healthcare worker, that kind of person. If you're not in that category, then uh, you don't go straight away to the doctors. All right, let's take some of these calls. We've got Nontlantla on the line. I think she's uh, in Durban. Nontlantla, thanks so much for joining us. What's your question for... Yes, sir. Okay, thank you so much for taking my call. My first question is, if um, I, I, I was in contact with someone who was traveling to one of these countries, let's say Italy, and they did test, but they tested immediately when they came back, how long does it take for the virus to, to, to be visible on his body? Do he, does he or she has to wait the 14 days and then test and then and then they will know that he's positive or he's not positive, or does he test straight away after coming back from those countries? All right, great question, Nontlantla. Thanks so much indeed. All right, so um, we've got a situation where you're in contact with somebody who's just come back, let's say from China or for Italy, wherever. They're asymptomatic, they get tested. If they're negative there and then, is, are all bets off? <laughs> Or do you wait 14 days, test again? What's the, what's the protocol? So the protocol right now is not to test people necessarily if they just come back from a high-risk country. Um, we're not focusing on people without symptoms. 
um, for several reasons. Um, the first is that the test doesn't work particularly well among people who are asymptomatic. It's a test that looks for the virus's genetic material. Um, so, so we're not really focused on people who are asymptomatic. Um, also because if you're asymptomatic, you don't need any specific right. management. Um, and also, just remember, we're in a resource-constrained setting. And so we really are trying to focus on people who are symptomatic. Mm. Um, and so if someone is, has returned from a high-risk country, uh, we are recommending that they self-quarantine. So they've been exposed potentially, they've come back, they need to self-quarantine at home for a min minimum of 14 days. And, and that's a, it's, it's not the easiest thing to yeah. do, I understand. So but what about those people that have come into contact with them? Must they also self-quarantine? So as far as possible, they should try to limit non-essential contact. But remember that the person who's returned is not a confirmed case. That person does not necessarily have this infection. Right. And so that family member is not a close contact of a confirmed case. Um, I think that it is pr prudent, though, for that person to minimize contact as far as possible because at some point during that 14-day quarantine period, the returning family member may actually develop symptoms and test positive, in which case there may, might have been transmission to members of the family. So I think people need to be sensible and try to limit non-essential contact. All right. So, okay. Neville is in Parktown here in Johannesburg. Neville, thanks very much uh, for joining us. So what's your question for the professor? Hello, Neville. Are you there? Yes. Hi. Good afternoon, Peter. Hello. Yes. Hi. Good afternoon, Peter. It's Melvin here. Good afternoon, Peter, and to the prof. Good afternoon. What's your question, Neville? Yes, I've got three quick questions. Firstly, what is the role of the traditional healing in this process? And secondly, is this testing the generic, you know, testing of the, you know, the, of the temperature or this um, temperature that is done at airports? only concerned about you know the, the temperature change of an individual then if that is the case where does the actual testing of the virus begin does it begin at the laboratory or and immediately the person is tested, tested for the temperature and the last question is are the figures that are given by the government are these the actual figures or these are only figures that are from you know private uh, clinics and hospitals and if that's the case are these the actual figures of the, of the pandemic in the country. Thank you. All right, thanks very much indeed. That's Neville in Parktown. So there's no known cure for coronavirus at this stage. So is there a role for traditional leaders in this scenario? I think that it's really important that we start looking at, um, at experimental therapies. Um, there are many clinical trials that are currently being considered. Um, for instance, the, the World Health Organization has proposed um, a clinical trial of several experimental therapies. Um, re just recently, um, um, a Chinese group published um, a, a good clinical trial in a high-impact um, medical journal showing that, unfortunately, um, an antiretroviral treatment um, did not work against um, coronavirus. Right infected people when they had severe pneumonia. So that was very disappointing. But I think that we need to keep an open mind and we need to look at potential therapies. But I want to emphasize that um, people should not be using um, medications that are not prescribed by their doctors. Um, and they should be very cautious of, um, of therapies that have not been uh, subjected to rigorous right. um, review. That is really important because we don't know what the safety and the, the efficacy is of, of treatments that have not been um, looked at in clinical yeah, trials. I was hearing people using different drugs for malaria and so on and so forth. Not great advice without the doctors uh, prescribing them specifically. All right, what about this testing that we see at the, uh, air, at, the ho at the airports. I suppose that's a first line of screening, really. It's not a test per se. That's correct. So it's a very, um, yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a first um, point of screening. As you say, it's symptom screening. Mm. 
And of course, people who don't have symptoms at the time that they cross the border will, of course, come straight through. Mm. And we know that the, from the time that you're exposed to the virus, someone coughs on you on, on a particular day, um, you'll probably only start developing symptoms on average about five days later. So you've got a five-day window during which you've got no symptoms and during which you can travel, pass through airports, and of course then not be picked up through the symptom screening. Um, so what we're recommending is if you come back from a high-risk country and you develop symptoms, you need to immediately go and see your doctor, local clinic, and arrange for testing through a laboratory because the laboratory is the only place where you can make a definitive diagnosis. Okay, all right. And then the third part of that question was the figures that we're hearing, these are what? So these figures come from the public sector and from the private sector. Remember that we've got testing laboratories now in the NHLS, the National Health Laboratory Service, as well as in the private sector. Um, as of this m today, um, we had more than 6,000 tests that were done, and as you pointed out, just over 200 confirmed cases. And those t tests were done in the public sector and in the private sector. All right, so let's go to uh, uh, Koza, who's in uh, um, Bombela. Thanks so much indeed for joining us. Uh, your question for the professor. Hello, Koza. This is uh, SABC News. What's your question for our professor? Koza, are you there? All right, okay, we seem to have lost that, that line there. Um, so, again, uh, we've got these things of uh, coughing and uh, into your elbow and sneezing. Just how is this disease transmitted from person to person? So there are two main routes of transmission. The major route of transmission is respiratory droplet spread. So someone coughs or sneezes, produces little droplets, and that, of course, can be moved at least a meter or two, right. you know, if you cough or sneeze um, violently. So that's the major route of transmission. Um, but of course, those droplets can also um, land on surfaces, on plastic, stainless steel, you know, hard surfaces. And in fact, we know that the virus can survive for up to 72 hours. So on the surface? On a surface. So you must be cleaning this with So you need to be cleaning your surfaces. Now the concern is not so much in your own home where mm. you and your family are living and if n none of you are infected in your home, then that's not so much of a concern. But if you are out in public and you don't know what is happening in your environment, then you need to make sure that if you touch a surface, especially high touch surfaces, door handles, um, lift, buttons, studio desks, esca <laughs> studio desks <laughs> escalator, rails, handrails, etc. If you're touching those surfaces, just be aware that if someone has coughed into their hands and then put their hands onto that, onto that surface, the virus may be viable mm. or alive on that surface. And so you need to make sure that you can touch it, it's fine. You don't need to wear gloves. I'm not recommending at all that you wear gloves. What I think is really important is if you are touching high, you know, high touch surfaces, you need to make sure you wash your hands before you touch your face, because okay. that is the, that's the transmission coming from the surface to your face, to your nose, to your mouth, to your, essentially okay. to your mucous membranes, and that's how you... Hence, washing your hands.